Sarah said just a moment ago with my introduction, I think it'd be a good idea to start out right now with exactly that in introduction. So I assume that most people, especially students, at some point in their lives have prepared an introduction in a new setting. Uh, for most people, this usually goes along the line of name, maybe where you're from, what you study, or what you like to do. And especially in college, it's a lot of name, major, field of study, etc. So my traditional intro goes a little bit something like this. Hi. My name is Susie Beal, and I study political science and education studies with a focus on nationalism and genocide studies. Now, to focus on that last part, first of all, I say it because it's true. That's just literally what I study. Uh, but second, and more strategically, I say that last part to subvert any stereotypes that began to form in the minds of people once I said the first part. Introductions are really important, and so are first impressions. And they start an immediate line of thinking as soon as you say it. So let's unpack that a little bit. Susie, woman. Political science, general. Education studies, sweet or benign. But what I want people to know when I say that I also study education and genocide studies in conflict is that I'm serious and mean business about a real connection between international relations and education. And I see that, and with a word, a very provocative word like a crime against humanity or genocide, immediately you can provoke people to make that connection in the eyes of others at that moment. Now, of course, I believe that education and international relations are related, but in reality, it should not have to take mention of a crime against humanity to have other people make that same connection in their mind. Oftentimes, we see international relations as a way by virtue of the word international, and education as home or domestic. But in reality, the two fields actually shape each other, and they're incredibly related in both practice and in theory. So practically, education and international relations uh, coincide because schools are the primary sites of political socialization for people. People go to school, become citizens, and then engage with the entire world around them. And theoretically, well, everything is essentially diplomacy, whether it's negotiating interests, international, uh, excuse me, interpersonal affairs, or representing yourself to a certain body of people. They're very intimately connected. But in the US, access to international re relations education in US public schools is incredibly limited and unequal. And in part, this is because we all have such a narrow definition of what international relations specifically is supposed to be. So if we were to open that up more, perhaps we would be able to teach more about international relations across fields. And this is a national problem. So the Common Core Standards for Social Studies state nothing at all about international relations, global or area studies, or world geography at all. And this contributes to a pipeline problem. So the school to international relations pipeline has actually become a school to career diplomacy pipeline. And this is because those who are encountering a, an international relations education in their public schools are really just getting it in the sense of what it means to be, in the most narrow sense, a diplomat, someone engaging in international relations. I'm talking UN, I'm talking think tanks, I'm talking foreign service. And the result of that problem is reflected by the demographics of the foremost diplomatic source uh, of the United States, which is the Foreign Service itself. So as you can see on these uh, statistics here, the US Department of State career diplomats for 2016 were only 18% non-white, whereas in the US it was 28% non-white as of the 2010 census. And for sex, in the US, only, uh, excuse me, in the Foreign Service career diplomats, only 40% of them are women, and in the US, 51% of citizens are women. So you can see that there's obviously a disconnect between the people who are going abroad to represent Americans and America. And that's because, in part, of this narrow definition of IR, who gets access to it and who practices it. So I'm going to prompt you all to imagine what a more inclusive definition of international relations might look like. If we could expand what we think of as international relations, perhaps we could illuminate the need for a broader education of people who don't just want to go into the State Department to be career diplomats, but simply people who want to engage with the world all around them. The tools to make the world a better place should not be limited to those who are lucky enough or have the ability to encounter and afford them. But unfortunately, in the US, we're not there yet. So as a result, when people try to seek out any type of education in international relations, what they're primarily looking to are supplementary programs, such as Model United Nations or summer sessions and summer academies. And the problem with these supplementary programs, while enriching for sure, is that they require a lot of extra time and prior knowledge about IR, a lot of time dedicated to practicing and prepping, and finally, a lot of money. 
So Mali United Nations programs are really exciting, but the bottom line is that they often self-select for hyper-academic and extroverted students who have the means, time, and money to travel around to different conferences, practice, take weekends away from home, and finally, of course, buy a business casual wardrobe. Um, and that's not accessible to everybody. And then on the other hand, you have summer sessions and summer academies. These are often very highly selective, again, expecting people to already have this amount of prior information about international relations before they apply, and they can be incredibly expensive. So I fall into this latter category. I had no formal international relations education during my time in U.S. public schools. So the summer of my junior year, I applied to a two-week-long intensive crash course program in IR, had a 30% global acceptance rate, and a $6,500 price tag for two weeks. And the bottom line of all of this is that had I not gotten very generous financial aid, I would not have been able to attend this program. And for me, that was my only chance to learn about IR. So no aid equals no program. Fortunately, I got some very generous aid, so I went to the program. And let me tell you, I had the best time. I absolutely loved it. This program completely blew my mind. And I ran the whole gamut of everything that's stereotypical about international affairs. So I read like Sun Tzu's The Art of War, learned about the UN and the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. I did a crisis simulation as an acting member of the Kenyan government, things I never really thought I would be doing. I learned what the word hegemony means, all types of things like that. Uh, and I had an amazing time. And after that program, I thought I knew it all about IR. I thought I kind of had it, had it nailed down past in the bag. So I set my sights on it. I was already determined to restructure all my college applications around this newfound passion that I had just discovered, and I thought it could be pretty easy. So again, changed my whole plan, was determined to do this in college, and didn't see a reason why my interest in education would not be easily fit into this new scheme of international affairs. So I got to college, and here's my five-year plan. I had it all laid out. Summer after my first year, I'd get an internship at the UN. Simple. Summer after my sophomore year, I'd get a return offer at the UN. Even simpler. Summer after my junior year, I'd be promoted to assistant secretary general of something. And then after graduation, I personally would be one of three on a short list to be the next secretary general of the United Nations. See? Easy, right? <laughs> Can anyone guess what happened? Certainly not that. So I basically got to college and realized almost immediately three things. Number one, my plan was absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> Number two, that this whole plan that I had laid out did not include my interest in education that I was so dedicated to prior to attending the summer program. And number three, that this debate that I had imagined was already rich and laid out between international affairs and education did not exist at all. So having fallen from grace from my diplomatic aspirations, um, I was sad and I was discouraged because I really thought that I got the full sense of what I wanted only to realize that that wasn't what I was practically going after at all. Uh, but even so, throughout all of this, I really still believe that there there was a deep connection between international affairs and education, and I didn't want to give that up. So I reconfigured my approach a little bit. So I knew that the disconnect between the two fields was a problem in my own community, so I kind of redirected all my energy and started there. And my mother always told me that if you want something done right, you just have to do it yourself. So that is what I did. And this began with a program called Hemispheres. Uh, it was talked a little bit about before, but Hemispheres would end up being the most rewarding and fulfilling experience I've had in my whole time in college. Uh, it is a nonprofit teaching group under the Yale International Relations Association that provides free weekly classes in international affairs to local New Haven High School students. And when I first got to Yale, I started applying to a bunch of things that you do to make friends, kind of flailing around like a fish out of water. And I found Hemispheres, and I thought, this is great. There's this club that so seamlessly meant together my two interests in education studies and international affairs. But I didn't really get the whole story at first. That was kind of all that I got. I thought, this is nice, this is education that just happens to be about IR. I never associated hemispheres with being IR. And it wasn't until a couple of weeks in that I started to realize the really disruptive and innovative work that hemispheres was doing. What they were doing was disrupting the knowledge pipeline of who gets to learn about international relations. They were providing free classes to students who otherwise would not have a chance to develop a literacy in IR, therefore giving them a whole new seat at a whole new conversation that these students would have never been a part of. And I thought that was amazing. 
So fortunately, I had the privilege of being uh, appointed their director for the 2017-2018 year, and along with a team of three other incredible Yale undergrads, we poured ourselves into expanding hemispheres as widely as possible. So throughout the year, from 2016 to 2018, we went from having 20 students attending each week to 70, offered uh, from two to four classes per week, and increased from serving three to 10 schools around the New Haven area. And this is really when I started to think, wow, maybe IR isn't exactly what I thought it was before. Because here I was disrupting this pipeline and changing the normative culture about who gets to learn about IR and for that matter what IR even is. But it was happening in a classroom on a Friday afternoon with pizza. It was not in the hallowed halls in the State Department in a business casual pantsuit. So my world is kind of being flipped around. And then it happened even more so. So then in uh, the fall of 2018, <coughs> I began to work as a student liaison for the Yale World Fellows Program. This is a program where global leaders from all around the world come to Yale to serve as visiting fellows, essentially, for one semester. And when I looked around at the fellows, I was suddenly surrounded by 20 of people who had become my coolest best friends ever, but also 20-ish people who became global leaders by first starting in their communities and identifying problems that they had access to and personal stake in. So looking around, they didn't look like this traditional career diplomat that I thought encapsulated and embodied IR. It was totally different. The people around me had made jumps between industries, they had taken time to take care of their families and even start families, and they really started their work at home. Yet now, they were global leadership. They were international relations. Again, this whole idea of what IR was supposed to be in my mind was totally flipping around. In seeing the fellows, their boldness and their ability to disrupt empowered and inspired me to then pursue a different type of IR because the diplomacy that I thought was normative was not something that I could fit into myself. So what we think international relations should be is in essence limiting what it actually could be. If IR were wider, it were a wider field that was spread out more in different fields, we could have a more comprehensive education about it, and more students could have the tools to interact with the world beyond their doorstep to identify things that they think are wrong, to stand by things that they think are right, and to ultimately speak the language of effective change. And this should not just be limited again to those who are able to access it. So I kind of took a cue from this lesson myself, and I began to, in the past year or so, work with IRIS, Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services. It's Connecticut's largest refugee resettlement agency. And now I spend my time mentoring young adults and helping them learn how to self-advocate and thrive in their new schooling environments that are worlds away from where they were now in the U.S. safe from persecution. That is international relations. And a couple of years ago, that is not something I ever would have attributed to being part of this field that I previously thought was so narrow. And I really wish that it didn't take me such a long time to realize this. It shouldn't have taken me such a reality slap in the face when I realized how absurd my five-year plan was to open my mind to all of this different world that IR can be. But it did, and I'm glad that now I'm here at this point to realize that IR has many faces. Yes, it's definitely happening, happening at the UN and at the State Department and among the Foreign Service, but it's also happening in a Hemispheres classroom weekly on Fridays from 3 to 5. It's also happening among the World Fellows, and it's also happening at IRIS during English language classes. IR has a lot of faces, so long as we can contribute it to that. So, a lot of things have changed in the grand scheme of my time in college and what I was up to, um, but some things have not also. I still go back to this introduction of introducing myself as, hi, I'm Susie, I study political science and education studies, focusing on nationalism and genocide studies. And yes, I still say that because it is still true, that is just what I study. But now I'm not saying that to prove that anything is connected to anybody. I'm saying that now because I'm proud of the work that I've done to ideologically expand the definition of what IR is. And my students and my co-teachers and my mentors all know that because they were there along the way to help force that path when nobody else was. And we're seeing results from it too. So just last week in a Hemispheres class on social movements, we were learning about the U.S.'s involvement in Latin America uh, during the Cold War era. And we asked the students, are you surprised by this? Because we know that they're not learning this in their social studies curriculum at school. And one of the students responded, no, of course not, whatever. I just learned that in Hemispheres last year. That is what a broader definition of IR could be. 
So when I introduce myself to people now, yeah, I still want to confuse them by putting into conversation international affairs and conflict with school, but again, not to prove anything to anyone. Instead, I want to show that I'm someone who wants to complicate someone else's worldview, and for the sake of having a more exclusive, a inclusive definition of how we coexist with each other and how we follow those rules, I hope that they will apply the same exact thing to me. Thank you.